So there's no better way to find some stillness than to listen to some beautiful music. And we're going to close this morning by listening to Angèle Dubot. Angèle's from Quebec. And uh, I'm reminded that when I launched a channel called Bravo, which at the time was a performing arts channel, a fine arts channel, I had this notion that I could blend the traditions of classical music with this new phenomenon called the music video. And I searched high and low to see where I might find some classical music video. And all of Canada at that time, I think I've got the date right, 1995, there were six music videos in the classical genre, and five of them featured Angèle Dubot. On her label, which is run by her husband, Mario Labbé, it's called Analecta. This is Angèle Dubot. Bonjour, hello, I'm Angèle Dubot. Nice to, to be with you today. 
Uh, the piece you just heard is the seventh fantasy for violin solo by Georges Philippe Telemann. And as Telemann uh, used to say, something like 400 years ago, uh, music is not the appanage of the elite, but rather a common good. I have made this quote mine for a long time now, and I like to believe in the message that music can be shared with everyone. Certainly, it's a question of taste, but prejudice should never have its place in music, I think. No one needs to know, play, or study music to be able to appreciate it. And when you have an open mind, heart, music can transport you through the entire, entire range of human emotions. You know, I studied in Romania from 1981 to 1984, uh, after studying my studying in, in Montreal, at the Montreal Conservatory. Then I went to, to Juilliard in New York. And finally, for three years, I was in Romania, studying uh, in Bucharest with Stefan Gheorghiu, uh, a great teacher, uh, where, well, it was not that easy to be there during that time. Um, we have to remember it was under the barbaric regime of Ceausescu. But it's a place where, uh, apart <laughs> being able after to appreciate what we have here uh, as a you know, condition for, for human, uh, I learned a lot over there. First, I discovered the people who through their music were able to express themselves freely. And that was one of the only way to be able to express themselves with freedom. It was with, with the violin, with their instrument. As a matter of fact, that's where I discover how to make my violin speak, how to make my violin cry, how to make my violin dance. Mm -hmm. I also learned a lot from my experience as a television host. For many years, I conceptualized and presented various TV shows uh, about music, of course the French, uh, French section of, of CBC. And I discovered that entering in the privacy of the audience's home every week through this mass medium made me accessible in the eyes of the people. Uh, my music stayed the same. I was the same as always. But this idea of accessibility made all the barriers towards classical music disappear. The best exam example I can give you is, is prayer to the TV shows, people would stop me in the streets and say, bonjour, Madame Dubo. And after this period of TV shows, they would just stop stopping me and say, hey, salut, Angèle. <laughs> but what I'm most proud of is when teenagers stop me and say, hey, you, you're really cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always, always thought that changing the coating of my performance with, with very small things like, lighting, mise en scène, uh, presentation, uh, well, of course, marketing, while always keeping respect and seriousness towards my work, made my performance just like me, more, much more accessible. I've been traveling the world for now, well, more than, than 35 years uh, with, with my violin, my best friend, and I've realized very young the power and effect that music, um, uh, you know, with, with no language of barrier, can have on all cultures. As a soloist, I've played with many orchestras, uh, also in recital with piano. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've formed my own orchestra. It's all women orchestra from with some of the best musicians in Canada. And, uh, and I named this, this orchestra La Pieta. The little story about La Pieta is um, I had this project in mind, this is 16 or 17 years ago, of doing some Vivaldi concertos. And I wanted to do it the way it was done at that time. So doing the solo and conducting at the same time while playing. So I knew great string orchestra in, in, uh, in Canada, but they were all coming with the conductor. <laughs> so I decided to, uh, to form my own. And here I am, countryside, with a piece of paper, just putting a few names of musicians of high virtuosity, 
uh, of course, musical qualities and, and human qualities, which is very important when you work in a group. So I was putting names on a piece of paper. After three, four names, I stop. I look at the names, make me laugh. The first name that came in my mind were women. And then I thought, hey, maybe it's a good idea and I can go up to 12, which was the number I needed for this, this particular project. Very easily. I called them, they all said yes, and, and Pieta was born. Of course, I needed a name for this, this ensemble. And I just remembered that, uh, well, a little more than, than 300 years ago in Venice, there was an, uh, an orphanage, the Hospitale de la Pieta. This orphanage where, of course, uh, our young orphans and illegitimate girls were all studying music under the direction of Antonio Vivaldi. So here was my name. Uh, so it's thinking of, of this memorable Pieta that I named the orchestra. And of course, today's Pieta is not made up of orphans, <laughs> but women that share all uh, the same passion for music. Uh, and you know, when I audition musicians, I always look for a high degree of virtuosity, musical qualities, like I was saying. And, but I also like to, to focus on finding that extra sparkle, uh, that extra adrenaline, which I call energy. Every, every touch, uh, extra touch of energy in La Pieta does not add itself up to the others, but rather multiplies itself. It, it's, it becomes exponential. Throughout the years, um, I have also tried to develop various themes around my cities and around, uh, of course, the, the, my live performance on, on stage. Um, focusing on, on one concept is not a way for me to narrow uh, my choices down, but rather to open my horizons on, on a particular thematic. I won't go through my 37 albums here, <laughs> but I will give you some examples. Uh, 12 years ago, I launched a, a CD called Infernal Violence. Uh, the idea of this concept was to explore the work of different composers from different eras, different styles, different countries, but all had their inspiration from the same devilish theme. So it was kind of a uh, voyage through time and space with this theme. So from Mephisto to uh, Tartini's The Devil's Trill and the Rolling Stones' Sympathy for the Devil, all the pieces chosen uh, for this project revolved around Edith's dominion. Another example is the concept of, of my new CD uh, that I just finished recording a few hours ago. Uh, <laughs> and that will be released next, uh, next fall. I wanted to reach the younger generation uh, in this project. So for months, I asked myself where I could find them musically speaking. And I finally thought of video game music. There, there, they, they, they are all in video game music. I listened and, and chose music from this universe, which I didn't know before. Uh, and I discovered extraordinary music that will not only uh, interpolate the younger generations, but will, and I'm convinced of it, will open uh, the doors of this growing world to everyone else as well. Another aspect of, of my musical career is the annual rendezvous that I, that I have uh, been organizing for almost now 15 years. And it's during the Labor Day weekend. It's a big musical feast called La Fête de la Musique. And it takes place in Mont Tremblant, in, in Quebec, in the village of Mont Tremblant. And it's at the bottom of the mountain where every year around 35 concerts and activities, free concerts and activities take place. I'm very proud to give this podium to hundreds of great Canadian musicians, from classical to jazz to world music. They all come to share their passion with the public. And I can never forget this young girl sitting in the grass, uh, listening to her first opera uh, concert with her Barbies, of course, dressed up for the occasion. And they were all dancing uh, with the sound of the opera. It was just magic. So finally, uh, music not only reunites different people and culture, but it also reunites generations. And I think, and I like to think that music is unifying. Thank you.
Angel, is that the Stradivarius? It is. <laughs> 1733. 30, yeah. 33? 33, yeah. 33. Wow. Yeah. How long have you had it? Uh, well, since, since 35 years now. And uh, do you own it or is yes, it on I loan? Do. I do. It's yours. It's mine. How oh, splendid. My baby. <laughs> have it's you ever crazy. forgotten it somewhere? Have no. you ever left <laughs> no. it on the subway? No. 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 <laughs> Great. Thank you. One more. That's great. Thank you. Thank and you. I'm, I'm sure people want to know how much is it insured for? Uh, that's, a, that's a question that, a secret. you know, that it's not to sell. So there's no price for a piece no of art price. like this. And, and of course, there's still a few hundreds in, in, in the world right now. But as you can imagine, uh, going through, uh, well, three, 300 years, many of them disappeared. But uh, it's just like a Rembrandt or, you know, a, 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 piece of art have no price. Just a it's, Rembrandt. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. This way. I go this way. Yeah.